Today on Macaulay Math, dividing polynomials. Buckle up. Intro. Okay, good day. I'm Professor McCulley. This is Math 150 Pre-Calculus, Lesson 6 on Dividing Polynomials. Our goals for today. We're going to use long division to divide polynomials by other polynomials. We're going to use synthetic division to divide polynomials by polynomials of the form x minus a. We're going to use the remainder theorem and the factor theorem. We're going to use the rational zero test to determine the possible rational zeros of polynomial functions. And then we're going to determine the upper and lower bounds for a zero of a polynomial function. In the previous two lessons, the discussion focused on manipulating polynomials by adding, subtracting, multiplying, finding the composition, and the inverse of functions. The concept of division is usually considered to be a higher order function, and therefore division needs its own section. This lesson discusses two methods of finding the quotient of two polynomials. First, through long division for all divisors, and second, through synthetic division for linear divisors. Additionally, because finding the factorization of polynomials can be cumbersome, the rational zero test and using upper and lower bounds will be discussed to make finding factors of polynomials a more approachable process. So we're going to start talking about polynomial division. And if you remember from the last lesson, we defined a polynomial this way, where we talk about a number of different terms that we don't know, depending on what the degree is. And we're going to be dividing these by other polynomials. So for us to get there, what I want to do is I want to start with a third grade division demonstration. Now, I learned division in third grade, and I wasn't very good at it. Everybody struggles with division from time to time. But if we use this little third grade example, what we can do is we can extend that to polynomials. And hopefully we'll, what we'll do is we'll make it easier. What I want to do here, 3 divided into 16 and we will go through the old division algorithm and what we'll do here is we'll say okay does 3 go into 1 and it doesn't so we don't put anything above it does 3 go into 16 well 3 does go into 16 5 times we will go 5 times 3 is 15 and then we will subtract that and 16 minus 15 leaves me 1, and this we called the remainder. So this part here we called the remainder. This part here is called the divisor. This is called the dividend. And this part here is called the quotient. And my final answer for this, if you remember, um, we would check. We go 5 times 3 is 15 plus 1 gives me the 16. And we could say that our final answer is going to be 5 and 1 third. The remainder divided by the divisor. The division algorithm, if f of x and d of x are polynomials such that d of x does not equal zero and the degree of d of x is less than or equal to the degree of f of x, there exist unique polynomials q of x and r of x such that f of x is equal to d of x times q of x plus r of x, where r of x is equal to zero where the degree of r of x is less than the degree of d of x. If the remainder r of x is equal to 0, then d of x evenly divides f of x. Now, if we look back at our previous example, we would not say that 3 divides 16. It does not divide 16 because we had a remainder. If 3 divided 15, we would have a remainder of 0. And so 3 divides 15, but 3 does not divide 16. And so I look at this thing here, 
and I go, okay, wait a second, what, what does this mean? Well, let's go back here to our check. And we could say that 16 is equal to 3 times 5 plus 1. And if we go back and we say that the divisor is d of x, if we say that the remainder is r of x, that the quotient is q of x, and that the dividend is f of x, then we can go through and say that f of x is equal to d of x times q of x plus r of x. And this thing right here is the division algorithm. All right. So even though they're using function notation, we are just doing the simple third grade long division. An example of long division says here, use long division to find the quotient of. And so they want us to take this fourth degree polynomial and divide it by a quadratic. And so we're going to set it up like a long division problem. And we will go x squared plus x minus 1 divided into x to the fourth minus 2x to the third plus 3x squared plus 2x minus 6. Now you'll notice I have every term here. I have x to the fourth, I have x to the third, I have x squared, I have x, and I have uh, just a 6, a constant. If I were missing one of these degree terms, what I want to make sure I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want to need to add a 0. And I'll have an example of that later. But when we do this division, it's a little bit different than long division from the example above. We only look at the first term in each polynomial. We don't care about the rest. We'll deal with that later. But we're trying to move from left to right. We're only going to work on the first terms and then we will keep moving over till we get to the end. So the first thing I want to do is I say, okay, what times x squared is x to the fourth? Well, x squared times x squared is x to the x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. And now I'm going to distribute. So x squared times x will be positive x to the third. And then x squared times negative one is negative x squared. And so I want to subtract away this entire thing. x to the fourth minus x to the fourth is zero. And that is why we focused only on the first two terms. Negative 2x to the third minus x to the third is negative 3x to the third. And then 3x squared minus negative x squared is like plus a positive, so this becomes plus 4x squared. Now we're going to bring the next term down, so I have plus 2x, and now I've completed my first row of the division. Then, just like in the last one, I only consider this leading coefficient right here, and I ask myself, what times x squared is negative 3x to the third. Well, negative 3x times x squared is negative 3x to the third. So now I distribute. Negative 3x times x squared is negative 3x to the third. Then negative 3x times x is negative 3 x squared. Then negative 3x times negative 1 is positive 3x. And again, we want to subtract away this whole thing. 3x to the third minus negative 3x to the third is 0. Those cancel. That's good. 4x squared minus negative 3x squared will be 7x squared. And then 2x minus 3x will be negative x. And so now I'm going to bring this last term down. 
as a minus 6. And now I ask myself, what times x squared is 7x squared? Well, positive 7 times x squared is 7x squared. And so 7 times x squared is 7x squared. Then 7 times x is 7x. Then 7 times negative 1 is negative 7. Trying to subtract all of that away. 7x squared minus 7x squared is 0. x minus 7x is negative 8x. And then negative 6 minus negative 7 is positive 1. And now, since the degree of what's left is less than the degree of the divisor, we are finished. And so our final answer for this is going to be the quotient It's going to be the quotient. So x squared minus 3x plus 7 and then plus the remainder negative 8x plus 1 over the divisor which was x squared plus x minus 1. Now, when the divisor is linear, you may use synthetic division. And with synthetic division, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a simple algorithm. We are going to list the coefficients of our dividend. And so in this case here, first thing I want to do we're going to list the coefficients of the dividend and we're going to add, and this is very important, We're going to add zeros for missing terms. So I'll start with the x to the third, and I so I'll have a 5. That's the coefficient of the x to the third term. There is no x squared term, so that's where this add zeros for missing terms comes in. I'm going to have a 0 for the x squared, then I'll have a 6 for the x, and then I'll have an 8. We'll put a bar down here with a little box, and what goes in the box is the value for x that makes this divisor 0. So to make the divisor equal to 0, what plus 2 is 0? Well, negative 2 plus 2 is 0. All right. And so we're going to bring down the first number. That'll be a 5. Negative 2 times 5 is negative 10. 0 plus negative 10 is negative 10. Negative 2 times negative 10 is positive 20. 6 and 20 is 26. Negative 2 times 26 is negative 52. Negative 52 and 8 is negative 40. So this here becomes your quotient, and this part here becomes your remainder. So for our final answer, we take these three numbers and they become the coefficients of your quotient. And so since I started with 5x to the third and I divided by x, x to the third divided by x is x squared. So this starts with 5x squared minus 10x plus 26 and then our remainder is negative 44. So we can do it a couple different ways. We'll just go minus 44 over 
our divisor, which was x plus 2. The Ranger theorem. If a polynomial f of x is divided by a binomial x minus k, then the remainder r is r equals f of k. And so essentially what that says is that this negative 44 that we got in that division is the same value that we would get if I took negative 2 and plugged it into this expression here. So there are some consequences of that. If f of x is a polynomial and for some constant c, if you plug in that c and you get 0, then x minus c has to be a factor of x, which we can also say means that x minus c divides f of x for both of those things. The rational zero test. If a polynomial, and here's an example of a polynomial, has integer coefficients. Remember your integers are your positive and negative counting numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7. Then every rational zero, a rational number is a fractional number. So anything that can be written as a fraction is a rational number has the form p divided by q. So rational zero, and again, fraction, where p divides a sub zero. So this p list is going to divide the constant, and q divides a sub n. a sub n is that leading coefficient. So all we're really looking at for these is this value here and this value there. I have an example. In this example, it says use the rational root test to determine the list of possible rational zeros of the polynomial. So the rational zero test says we look at the leading coefficient and the constant term to make a list of all of the possible fractional or rational zeros. We will start by looking at the 12 and I'll make a list of P and I'm making a list of all of the values that divide 12. Well, plus or minus 1 divides 12. Plus or minus 2 divides 12. Plus or minus 3 divides 12. Plus or minus 4 divides 12. Plus or minus 6 divides 12. And plus or minus 12 divides 12. That is the entire list of all of the numbers. And then we're going to look at what divides the 3. We'll call that the Q list. And that list is a little shorter. It's only plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 3. Those are the only values that divide 3. And so the list of possible rational zeros is just the list of all of the values P over Q. So our list of P over Q is going to be all of the values p over all of the values q. So if I go 1 divided by 1, that's just 1. 2 divided by 1 is just 2. 3 divided by 1 is 3. So this list is repeated again. So plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 6 plus or minus 12. And now we've done all of those numbers over 1. We must also do all of these numbers over 3 as well. Plus or minus 1 divided by 3, plus or minus 2 divided by 3. Now we would go plus or minus 3 divided by 3, but that's 1 and we already have that. So I move over to the 4. I'll have plus or minus 4 divided by 3, and then I move over to the 6. 6 divided by 3 is 2, and I already have that. And then 12 divided by 3 is 4, and I already have that. So that is the list of all of the possible rational zeros. I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and double it. That means there's 18 possible fractional zeros. Now that's a lot, I know but we've narrowed the number from infinity down to 18. I think that that at least is a good improvement. There are other 
additional tools that we can use to make this list even smaller yet. Descartes' rule of signs. Let a polynomial function be of the form that we're used to so far with real coefficients and the constant not being equal to zero. The number of positive real zeros of f is either equal to the number of variations of sine of f of x or less than that number by an even integer. The number of negative real zeros of f is either equal to the number of variations of sine of f of negative x, and you'll notice that's different. So for this negative real zeros, we're going to have to do a little bit more work or less than that by an even integer. Let's talk about an example. So I'm given this function here. My constant is not equal to zero. And so it says use Descartes' rule of signs to determine the number of possible positive and negative real zeros. So when I look at this, I'm going to say that f of x is equal to negative 3x to the third plus 20x squared minus 36x plus 16. Now, in the definition, it says the number of possible positive real zeros is either equal to the number of variations of signs or less than that by an even integer. So first thing we need to do is count the number of sign changes. It starts with a negative and goes to a positive. That is one sign change. Then it goes from positive to negative, so I have two sign changes. It goes from negative to positive, I have three sign changes. So for part A, the number of possible positive zeros is either 3 or less than that by an even number, 1. All right, so the consequence of that, if as a for instance, I found a longer polynomial that had five sign changes, well, then the possible number of positive real zeros would be 5, 3, or 1. If I found one that had four sign changes, it could have 4, 2, or 0. Now, to find the number of possible negative zeros, I have to plug in negative x. All right, so if I plug in negative x, I'll go negative 3 times negative x to the third plus 20 times negative x squared minus 36 times negative x plus 16. When I raise negative x to the third, I'll get a negative. Negative times a negative is a positive. This will be 3x to the third. When I take negative x and I square it, I get a positive. So positive x squared times positive 20 is positive 20x squared. Negative 36 times negative x is positive 36x, and then I bring in my 16. Now, this one, it starts positive, and I have no sign changes. So the result from that is, since I have no sign changes, I would say for this one that there is no possible negative real zeros. All right, there's my part A. Part B says list the possible rational zeros. All right, well, we've already done an example like that. So for part B, I'll make my list of P values. And I look at this constant term. So all of the integers that divide 16 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 8, and then plus or minus 16. The values for Q are the values that divide negative 3. Well, just like in the last 
example that we did, we only have plus or minus 1, and then we have plus or minus 3. All right, so our final answer will be all the values of p over q. So we'll go back up to this final answer list here. We'll go b as our second answer. So 1 over 1 is 1, 2 over 1 is 2, 4 over 1 is 4, 8 over 1 is 8, and 16 over 1 is 16. So my P over Q list starts, and I'll probably have to wrap around, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 8, plus or minus 16, and then I have to do all of those over 3 and None of those will reduce, so unfortunately I'll have to include plus or minus one-third, plus or minus two-thirds, plus or minus four-thirds, plus or minus eight-thirds, and then finally plus or minus sixteen-thirds. And that is my list of P over Q. Now it says use a graphing calculator to reduce your list of zeros, and then we were asked to verify the zeros. So once we use the graphing calculator, we're actually going to find the zeros. We're going to reduce this list a lot. But I am going to ask that you verify your real zeros by using either synthetic division or the quadratic formula. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's go to Desmos. Here we see our function graph. And we can see that all of the work that we have done so far has been proven to be true. We said that the possible number of positive zeros is either 3 or 1, and we notice that we have 3 positive zeros. We also found out that there were no possible negative real zeros, and there are no negative values where I have a 0. I can use Desmos to click on these values here, and we see that 4, 2, and 0.667 in decimals, we can assume that's two-thirds, we should be able to verify that these values are our zero. And for part B, what we're going to do is we're going to do some synthetic division. And so I'll start with these coefficients again. So I'll go negative 3, and then 20, and then negative 36, and then 16. All right. So let's start with zeros that are easy. I'm not going to start with two-thirds because it's a fraction. Let's start with four and then we'll do two. So we think that four is going to be a zero. Let's bring down the negative three. Four times negative three is negative twelve. Negative twelve and twenty is eight. Eight times four is thirty-two. 32 and negative 36 is negative 4. 4 times negative 4 is negative 16. 16 and negative 16 is 0. So now I have verified that 4 is a 0 of our polynomial. I also want to verify that 2 is a 0 of this polynomial. But I don't have to start over. I've already divided out the factor x minus 4 Let's just divide out the factor x minus 2 by putting a 2 there. Again, I bring down the 3, and then 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. 8 and negative 6 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Negative 4 and 4 is 0. Now, I started with negative 3x to the third. So this coefficient here is negative 3x to the third. I divide out x minus 4. That means this result will be negative 3x squared. I divide out x minus 2, meaning that this will be negative 3x to the first. So this result right here is negative 3x plus 2. Now my final 0, if I set this thing equal to 0, I subtract 2 from both sides. They have 3x equals negative 2. And then I divide both sides by negative 3, and I get x equals 2 over 3, which is 0.6 repeating. So my zeros x equals 
two thirds, two, and four. Upper and lower bounds. Let f of x be a polynomial with real coefficients and a positive leading coefficient. Suppose f of x is divided by x minus c while using synthetic division. If c is greater than zero and each number in the last row is either positive or zero, then c is an upper bound of f. Now, what does that mean? If we go back to this example right here, you'll notice that we made this list of zeros. And what an upper bound does is that if you pick a value and you plug it in, if you didn't have graphing calculator and you picked a value and you plugged it in and the result were all positive numbers, you wouldn't pick a number that is bigger than that. So if I didn't have a graphing calculator and I wanted to find zeros and I had this big long list, I wouldn't necessarily pick 12 right away. I'd pick something in between that. So let's say as a for instance, I picked positive 4. And if I did positive 4 and we went through a synthetic division like this, and all of these coefficients that were the result were positive, that means that 4 would be an upper bound, meaning that I would not choose any number bigger than 4 to test. I can eliminate that value. Similarly, if you pick a negative number and put it in, and that last row is alternately positive and negative, then C is a lower bound of F. All right, so let's do an example, which kind of show you what I mean there. I have this example right here. It says show that four is an upper bound. Now, we're not gonna go through and make a list of all of the possible rational zeros, but you'll notice eight divided by two is four, so four would definitely be in that list. All right, let's show that four is an upper bound. Let's write these coefficients. So we'll go two, we'll go negative three, we'll go negative 12, and we'll go eight. And then we'll put our 4 right there. Bring down my 2. 2 times 4 is 8. 8 and negative 3 is 5. 5 times 4 is 20. 20 and negative 12 is 8. 8 times 4 is 32. 32 and 8 is 40. And you'll notice all positive And since I have all positive coefficients, 4 is an upper bound. Then I want to show that 3 is a lower bound. All right, so we'll use the same coefficients. And we'll put in our negative 3 there. I bring down the 2. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Negative 6 and negative 3 is negative 9. Negative 3 times negative 9 is positive 27. 27 and negative 12 is 15. 15 times negative 3 is negative 45. Negative 45 and 8 is negative 37. And you'll notice my numbers in that final list alternate. Positive, negative, positive, negative. And since they're alternating positive and negative, negative 3 is a lower bound. Next example, it says given f of x is equal to x to the third plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 4 with k equaling to negative square root of 5, let d of x be equal to x minus k, then first we want to write f of x equals d of x times q of x plus r of x form, and then we want to use a graphing calculator to show that um, f of k is equal to our remainder. So we will do that. Now, negative square root of 5 is not going to be an easy value to use, but this is pre-calculus, so sometimes we get some hard ones. But we're still going to do the same process, and we may have to do some work off to the side, but that's okay. Now, I know that when I 
plug in negative square root of 5, some of the results are going to be a little funky and they, we may have to do a little work on the side. So what I want to do is I want to make this a little bit bigger than the ones that I've done in the past so that I have space to deal with this thing. So um, writing those coefficients, and again, there's no number here, so we assume there to be a 1 for the x to the third and then a 2 for the x squared, and then a negative 5 for the x, and a negative 4. We'll put a bar here, and we're going to put that negative square root of 5 right there. Just like the rest of them, I bring down the 1. Negative square root of 5 times 1 is negative square root of 5. Now, these two things are not like terms, so I have to, we're just adding them. So I get 2 minus square root of negative 5. So now when I multiply this negative square root of 5 times this thing, I have to distribute. We will do that. Negative square root of 5 times 2 is negative 2 square root of 5. Negative square root of 5 times negative square root of 5 is positive 5. And so negative 5 plus 5 is 0, leaving me with negative 2 square root of 5. Now negative 5 times negative 2 square root of 5 will be a positive because negative times a negative is positive. Square root of 5 times square root of 5 we already know is 5 times 2 will give me a 10 and so negative 4 plus 10 is 6. Alright, remember this part right here is your quotient. We are dividing and so this part is my divisor will be x plus square root of 5 and again because we always change the sign of what goes in the box this is my divisor and this is my remainder so let's answer the question so they want us to write f of x in d of x times q of x plus r of x form all right so what we'll do is we'll say f of x and we'll just say that that's that thing, is now equal to d of x, okay? The divisor is d of x, so x plus square root of 5. The quotient is this thing. So I started with x to the third, and I divided by x, so this will start with 1x squared, and then it will be plus. This is the coefficient, so I'll make it 2 minus square root of 5 times x. And then this is the constant, so it's just minus 2 square root of 5. And then that's my remainder, so plus 6. And I have, this is my d of x, this is my q of x, and this is my r of x. And so that is my part A. And then part B says... Use a graphing calculator to show that f of k is equal to r, all right? So basically what they're saying is if I plug k into f of x, I should get the remainder 6. So let's do that. Let's go to Desmos. And so here we have our function. And so what I want to do is I want to plug in k equals to negative square root of 5. Okay, we can do that. So I'm just going to go f of negative square root of 5. We'll close that parenthesis and we see that that result is 6, which is what we got. And so we have verified part B. Next example. Given x to the third minus 31x plus 30 is equal to 0 and x equal to negative 6, use synthetic division to show that the given value for x is a 0 and then use that result to find the remaining zeros. All right, in this case, I start with an x to the third. All right, so what I'm gonna use, this x equals negative six as my divisor. We'll make a list of the coefficients. Since there's no value in front of the x to the third, we know that we have a one. There is no x squared, so I have to place a placeholder. And again, that is so very important. That's where all of my students in the past make their biggest mistake is they forget to add zeros. Minus 31 for the x and then plus 30. And so we'll plug in this negative 6. I bring down the 1. 1 times negative 6 is negative 6. 0 and negative 6 is negative 6. 
negative 6 times negative 6 is positive 36. 36 and negative 31 is 5. Negative 6 times 5 is negative 30. So we have a 0 here. And that's what we wanted to do. We have used synthetic division to show that the given value for x is a 0. We have shown that when we plug in x equals negative 6, we get 0 out. This result here is a quadratic. This result is x squared minus 6x plus 5. And so since this is a quadratic, we can use the things that we learned in Algebra 2 to figure out the remaining zeros. All right. Yes, we could go through and do synthetic division. We could do the P over Q bit, and that will work. But we have an easier method we can use the quadratic formula but because the leading coefficient is one we should at least try to factor that so i am asking myself what are two factors of five that add up to negative six can i do that and the answer is yes we can do that negative five plus negative one is negative six and then negative five times negative one is positive five so my factors here are x minus five and x minus one and since the question asks, find the remaining zeros, the remaining zeros are the values. We already knew they told us that negative 6 was a 0. So the remaining zeros are the values that make these two factors equal to 0. So 5 minus 5 is 0. So 5 is a 0. And then 1 minus 1 is 0, so 1 is a 0. Any value that makes a factor equal to 0 is a 0. Next example, it says verify the given factor of the function. Find the remaining factors, write the complete factorization, and make a list of all the zeros. Now these last two here are very much related. Usually they won't ask you both questions in a problem, but they might ask you to do one or the other. And so you have to be able to do both. Verify the given factor of the function. We'll do that. We will use synthetic division. These coefficients are all listed and there are none missing. So I have three, I have two, I have negative 19, and I have six. And I want to verify that this is a factor. So what makes x plus three equal to zero? Negative three makes x plus three equal to zero. I bring down the three. Three times negative three is negative nine. Negative 9 and 2 is negative 7. Negative 7 times negative 3 is positive 21. 21 and negative 19 is 2. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, and I get 0. All right, and so here I want to find my remaining factors. And since we divided x plus 3 into a 3x to the third, the result here will start x squared. So I have 3x squared minus 7x and then plus 2. Now, we could try and factor this, and I think it's factorable, but because I have this leading coefficient being 3 and not 1, just to review, I'm going to use the quadratic formula on this. And if you recall, the quadratic formula... is if ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0, then x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Here is my a, here is my b, here is my c. So we will just plug in and we will say that x is equal to 7 plus or minus the square root of negative 7 squared minus 4 times 3 times 2 all over 2 times 3. And we'll simplify what's underneath the radical. So I have my 7 plus or minus. Uh, 7 squared, even though it's negative, is 49. And then 4 times 3 is 12. 12 times 2 is uh, 24. And so 49 minus 24 is going to be 25 
all over 6, and that's good. That makes our lives easier because the square root of 25, 25 is a perfect square. I have 7 plus or minus 5 all over 6. So we, since these are all like terms, we do need to reduce that, reduce this expression. And we have to do both the plus and the minus. So 7 plus 5 is 12 divided by 6 is 2. And then 7 minus 5 is 2 divided by 6 will be 1 third. All right. So let's go back up and check. It says verify the given factor. So we did that. There's my part A. Find the remaining factors. So these things here are the zeros. And so, so for part B, our final answer, we want to make factors out of them. So the first one's easy. It's just x minus 2. Now, because this is a fraction, what we'll want to do, and our leading coefficient here was 3, what we'll want to do is we will put the 3 as a coefficient of the x, and then we'll do minus 1 there. And then if I plug in 1 third, 1 third times 3 is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, that is correct. So there are my remaining factors. And then in part C, it says write the complete factorization. Well, the complete factorization will be these two factors that we found, x minus 2 and then 3x minus 1. And then the first factor that we were given, which was x plus 3, so we'll put that there. And then part D says make a list of the zeros. And we know what all the zeros are. We know that negative 3 is a 0. And then what we found here are the other two zeros. So our zeros will be x equals to negative 3, 2, and 1 third. And that's it. Sorry that one was a long one, but division takes some time. And with that, the Star Wars fun fact of the day, the remains of the set of Episode 4, A New Hope, still remain in Tunisia, and a new form of tourism has sprung up as fans make a pilgrimage to see what has been left behind. That's all I got for today, folks. Have a good day. Goodbye.